All right, as I said, we're going to do things much differently this morning. So take your Bibles. We're going to get right into the message this morning, and then we will come back and do some of the things we normally do in the preliminary um, during or after the message. But take your Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians. Sorry, I'm not in Revelation this morning. Uh, but we're going to be in Colossians. This is uh, a Father's Day message. I'll tell you exactly. Well, I, I won't now. But I, you will eventually understand why we are going to this passage. And why I'm wanting to get go through the message first this morning. My wife gave me a... Uh, Father's Day card this morning. She didn't know I was going to use it, but I couldn't have thought of a better card to show you than what she gave me this morning that goes right along with what we're going to be talking about. It's a picture, and, and by the way, the reason she gave this, her mom had a stash of greeting cards, birthday cards, anniversary cards, wedding cards, all kinds of cards some of which she actually wrote in, but most of them, they were just blank cards that she had picked up along the way, liked them, and had planned on giving them out. So one of the things Julie's doing uh, in giving out cards a lot of the times these days, to at least the family, is taking one of the cards that Mom Curtis had in her collection and using them. And so it has a special meaning beyond just the greeting card. It's one of those cards that I'm definitely going to keep um, but anyway, so this is a card that her mom picked up somewhere along the way. I have no idea where she picked it up, but um, it's a Father's Day card. I'm sure she probably intended on giving it to her husband, my dad-in-law. They were farmers. And if you'll notice, on the front of the card, it has a tractor. If you can see that. And yet, can't make that out? Sorry. I'll have, to, I'll have to let you look at it at the end. But there's a tractor here, and there's a field here and a fence. And this guy is saying, raising kids is easy if you use the right amount of food and don't plant them too deep. <laughs> right amount of food and don't plant them too deep. And what we have in here is a field that's got some something you know growing over here and then it's got a bunch of heads sticking up kids heads sticking up out of the ground all right now given the fact that they were farmers and all oh, this was extremely appropriate but it's also very appropriate for what i want to talk about today colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. This passage is full of of instruction from Paul that I believe is appropriate especially for fathers. What verse was that? Verses 6 and 7. Thank you. Hebrews 10 23 says let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. Over and over and over in the New Testament, the authors, the writers of the various letters that we find as part of the epistles and uh, of the New Testament, most of course of which were written by Paul. Peter wrote some, John wrote some. But these men of God were writing instructions to Christians and churches in the first century after Christ had gone and after there was 
a fair amount of doctrinal error that was already creeping in to the churches. Many of the epistles, including the book of Colossians, was writ were written to address those errors. In the, in the church at Colossae, there was, um, which we find uh, was um, established by Epaphroditus. We find that in chapter 1, verse 7. I'm sorry, Epaphrodite. Epaphras. Epaphras. Um, in a very short time, people started coming in and teaching error. And the particular error that was coming into the Colossae church was a particular form of what we call the Judaizers, which taught that Christ wasn't really God or various variations of it. And so Paul tells these, church, these Christians, these believers at the church at Colossae, he tells them in verse 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. It is assumed by Paul that the audience of his letter are believers. They trusted in, and it's notice it says, Christ Jesus the Lord. It's very interesting. I've told you many, many times that in the Bible... The word, God not only gave us his word, as Brother Nichols talked about in Sunday school, but he was very specific in how he gave it. The Bible tells us that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we don't know exactly the process or how it exactly happened, but we know that the writers of our scriptures were spoken to directly by God through the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote. And they wrote things in very specific things. And these are messages from God. And in this particular instance, when Paul says, Christ Jesus the Lord, it is no accident that that's how he identifies our Savior. Now, it's very common in Scripture for Jesus Christ, the phrase Jesus Christ, or the name, the title, Jesus Christ to be found in the New Testament. You find that often. It is the most common title for Christ or Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Only a couple of times do you find it Christ Jesus. It's usually Jesus Christ and only twice do you find this title Christ Jesus the Lord in the New Testament. And in this case, the fact that Christ, and when, you, when, when, Christ, when Jesus is identified as Christ, that is a Greek word which would identify to the readers that he is the Messiah. It's the Greek word Christos. It talks about the fact that Jesus is that promised Messiah to the Jews, which is very important because, again, a lot of the Judaizers, they tried to teach that he was a good person, but he wasn't really God, or he wasn't the Messiah, or and there were all kinds of variations of that that they were falsely teaching in this first century. In this case, Paul is telling the, the, church, the Christians at Colossae, you have already trusted, you put your faith and trust in that... Who, he who is the Messiah, Christ, Jesus. Now, Jesus is the, the human name. So it's the Messiah and his, the fact that he was fully human, fully God, fully human, is really what Paul's saying here. And then he goes beyond that to say, the Lord. And he's telling the, the Colossae believers here, this is the one whom you must listen to, whom you must obey. He is the Lord. He's the ruler. And he has a right 
to tell us how to live. So he says, and, and these believers had trusted that. They understood that from Paul. Now, also understand, Paul has never met these believers. This is not a church that was established by Paul himself. In fact, when Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison. It's one of the, it's one of the letters that we call the prison epistles because it was written by Paul from prison. Now, understand what that meant. Paul wrote this letter sitting on a cold, concrete floor with a guard chained to him on at least one side. And he wrote this letter to these believers. And he says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Basically, Paul is saying, you believed him, now follow through. Because just believing isn't enough. Now, don't take that too literally here, as I said that. Yes, believing will get you to heaven. But God does not save you so that you can just go your own way. And in fact, if you do that, I'm going to make one of those statements again. If you just trust Christ and then you just kind of go your own way and you're not trying, you don't have a hunger for God and his word and you're not growing, I have a question about whether you really truly are trusting him. And I believe I can back that up from scripture. So Paul says, you've, less, you've trusted him, now you walk in him. And you know, it's real easy, especially in our day and age. It is so easy to talk the talk, but not walk the walk. And basically Paul is telling these believers at Colossae, don't just talk the talk. Don't just think you made a prayer and you're good. He says, you need to walk in Christ Jesus too. So walk ye in him. So I've titled the message, Walking the Christian Walk. And this message is particularly to fathers, but I believe it is also for all of us today. So then verse 7 goes on and he tells us how we are to walk. At first, the first word it uses is the word rooted, which of course is an agricultural term. To any plant that you plant, and, that, and again, that's why that card was so interesting because, you know, it says... Kids aren't too hard to, to grow as long as you don't plant them too deep. When you put that seed in the ground, there, it, it, it's a pretty exact science as to how deep that seed needs to go in the ground, how much water that seed needs to grow and, 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 and to, to become productive. And Paul tells the believers that they are to be rooted in Christ. Rooted has the idea of strong support. And I want, I want to mention several things about roots. Think about a large tree. A tree is only as strong. How many of you have ever seen a tree that's been uprooted? Most of you probably have. I have seen some trees that got uprooted by the, a, a storm that the root structure that was standing up out of the ground was humongous. And you wonder how in the world that tree could, could even be blown over with that, much, that, that kind of a root structure. It's said that the, the roots of a tree have to go down as deep and as wide as the tree goes up and out above ground if it's going to be a stable tree. And as I was 
studying this and one one commentator mentioned a tree that I'd never actually heard of, a tree that's called the Methuselah tree. Anybody ever heard of that? It's in California. It's uh, some kind of a redwood. It's not a redwood. It's not a redwood. It's some kind of a pine tree. And I don't remember the, the kind of pine. I looked it up. And I looked up pictures of this thing. Yes, they got to be the ugliest tree I've ever seen. All gnarly. and it, it, Scientists guess that that tree is over 4,000 years old. Which means that that tree was full grown and growing when Christ walked this earth. It means that that tree probably began to grow not long after the flood. That's how old that tree is said to be. It is a humongous tree. And they say that the roots on that thing go forever. But one thing I want you to understand, and, and God tells us as believers, we are to be rooted in him, in Christ. That means that our source of life has to be God. We need to get our roots down deep into the truths of God's word if we are going to grow as a believer. And there's really only a few ways that you can do that. Obviously, you have to be in God's word so that you're learning God's truth. You have to be speaking to God through prayer, two-way communication with your God regularly. If all you ever pray for is before a meal and at Wednesday night church, you are not communicating with your God enough. And you're not going to be rooted. It also, the only other way that you get grounded in God's word is in fellowship with God's people and in God's house getting good preaching. And I hope you get that here. I try very hard to dig into God's word and to bring things that will help you to grow. Another thing I want you to think about and notice or, or realize that roots are the part of the tree that you don't ever see. Why am I saying that? We put far too much emphasis on what you see the outward body our actions and if you have the right kind of roots that are bringing up the right kind of food from the spiritual word of God you're going to show that in the tree you are and Jesus himself said by your fruits you shall know them so yes what we see above comes from the roots, but the, what really makes the tree are the roots because that's what gets the food. And Paul is telling these believers, you need to have yourself rooted in this book, learning from this book, growing from this book. If you're not growing, why? Either your roots aren't where they're supposed to be, or something. But Paul tells the believers that they are to have a strong support, a root system. Ephesians 3, 17 and 19 say that Christ may dwell in you, your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all fullness of God. He uses this analogy or this image of being rooted several times in the New Testament. 
1 Corinthians 3 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, he talks about the foundation. So we are to have a strong support. We are to have a superstructure. It says rooted and built up in him. We are to have a superstructure. And this is the part that you see. Many buildings have been built over the years that have stood the test of time. I'd love to have the opportunity to go to Europe sometime or to Italy and see some of the great edifices that have been built over the years. Many of which date back way back. <laughs> There are strong structures. There are, there, but Paul says we are to be a superstructure. That which is above ground. That which people see. You're to be rooted first. And then built up on that foundation. To be a superstructure. In Ephesians 2. 20 to 22 it says. And, uh, tell, you know, Paul tells the Ephesians. And are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together and groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom, also, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Again, Paul uses that idea of being built up. Now the neat thing about this part of the message is the fact that every one of us might be in different stages of our building up. That's okay. As long as we're continuing to put brick upon brick, as long as we're beginning, continuing to build that structure up, that structure that people see that will glorify your Father, that will demonstrate your trust in God, and that will point people to the Savior who made your structure possible. Rooted and built up. A strong support, a superstructure. And But don't forget the sovereign Savior, it says, in Him. Unfortunately, and again, this is why Paul was writing this book, but many believers... are grounded and they are building a structure but it ain't it pardon my english but it ain't on the sovereign savior Amen. it's on some other christ paul calls them antichrist who teach the philosophy of the world paul says beware lest any man deceive you through philosophy and vain deceit by the rudiments of the world and folks our world has so pervaded the church with their own philosophy. I hope you're very careful what you read and what you see allowed to enter your mind through TV. Even the news is so pervasively evil and founded on man's thinking and not God's thinking in so many areas and I could I could park there and talk for the rest of today and more but I won't a strong support a superstructure a sovereign savior in him then it talks about a stable surety it says established in the faith the word established you all know about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, okay, that was built and the foundation was not well, not a good foundation and it's leaning and it says they say it keeps leaning some, so much, so much every year or every whatever. God wants our building to be level and stable. If you have a problem being stable then check your foundation he says established 
in the faith. It's our, folks, we are saved by faith and we live our Christian life by faith. Things happen we don't understand. Trials come, sickness comes, other hard issues of life come our way. And if we aren't grounded on God and trusting him, knowing that he does everything well, we're not going to be stable in the faith. We have a strong support. We have superstructure. We have a sovereign savior. Savior, we are to be, we are to be uh, have a stable surety that's in Christ. And then it talks about systemic or systematic schooling. It says, "As ye have been taught." And again, that, I go back to, that's why you need to make sure you're under good teaching of God's word. Watch who you listen to. Don't listen to people that aren't teaching the truth. And there's a lot of them out there. But it's systematic schooling. Teaching is not something that happens once. Any good school teacher will tell you the key to good education is repetition. Getting exposed to things over and over is important. And that's why it is important, folks, for you to be in this book on a regular basis. Not just when you hear it preached here at church on Sunday. You need to be in God's word every day if you're going to grow. You need to be feasting on the treasures of God's word. And as Brother Nichols said in Sunday school. You look at some of the Christians that have not had God's word. And how they act when they get even a page of scripture. And how much they value it. And yet as Brother Nichols aptly said. In America we are so spoiled. Again I, I've told you. Uh, my mentor, Pastor Vaughn, he always used to say that Christians in America are like cats drowning in milk. That's what we are. We take it so much for granted. We have got to be in God's word. And man here today who are fathers, I beg of you, be in God's word. Let your family see you in God's word. Let it be changing you. Let the truths of God's word pervade your thinking. So that in every area of thinking. And also don't let me forget. Or don't, remember, don't forget. Guard that part of you. That nobody else sees. The roots. You can let stuff come into your life. That nobody sees but you. And it will destroy you. That's a systematic schooling. And then last of all. It says a satisfied spirit. It's interesting that he ends this verse. He says abounding therein with thanksgiving. There are many verses in the Bible. Over in chapter 3, Paul talks again in verse 15 and says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, 18 says, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God wants us to be a thankful people. Far too often, we aren't. We gripe and we complain. We don't get our way. We're like a little kid. Who doesn't get the right toy and has to fight over it. 
And again, this is a Father's Day message. Father, fathers, do you demonstrate thankfulness in the home? Do you teach your children how to be thankful in the hard times? You see, there's a reason Paul put that at the end of this verse. Because if you are rooted in Christ, if you are growing and built up in him, and you are in him, if you have that stable structure that you're established in the faith and learning from him is being taught, if all those are true, you are going to be thankful. So if you're the kind of person that does a lot of griping and complaining, that automatically tells me that your roots are not going where they're supposed to be going. Walking the Christian walk. Are you doing that? <coughs> Are you rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in the same with thanksgiving? I hope that you will take that verse and that you will meditate on it, that you will study it, and that you will ask God to help each one of these to be true in your life. Because this is the only way you're going to make a difference. And fathers, this is the only way you're going to be the right kind of father to the children that God has given you. You need to be setting the example in these areas. To show your children what true Christianity means. Why do so many, why do so many Many children of Christian parents leave the home and turn their back on Christianity. Far too often it's because, and this isn't the case every time, I'm not making a judgment on anybody, because I know many of you have children that aren't walking with the Lord. And so I am not trying to judge you personally. But so often it's because the children see a different walk at home than they hear a talk at church. Amen. And we need to be sure that we not only talk the talk, but we walk the walk. And that's what Paul was telling the church at Colossae to do. Take your hymn books, please. Turn to hymn number 379. 379. I hope this is your prayer today. Whether you're a father or not, that God would take your life and let it be consecrated to him. Let's sing together. Um... We really don't have time to sing all the verses. Let's just sing uh, the first verse and the fifth and then the sixth. The first, the fifth, and then the sixth of this song. Take my life and let it be. Josie? Ready? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. On the fifth, take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. 
Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be